welcome to an all new dub stock presented by wendy's get a one dollar 99 cent honey butter chicken biscuit today and wendy's is bringing kendra andrews and myself grant liftman together to discuss a warriors team that i don't know how yogi Berra could have said it any better than um, deja vu all over again and it's just Groundhog Day. I don't know another metaphor or idiom to use, Kendra, but these losses that we've seen, they've lost 33 games this season, and I tweeted out that 45 of them have been similar to the game they lost on the back-to-back with the Pelicans. Yeah, I mean, it really is just the same thing over and over and over again. Every time it feels or it looks like that there is some – movement some some steps forward you're kind of knocked back and okay yes this team is exactly what their record says they are which is hovering right about around 500 they're okay they're fine (laughs) you know what I mean but that's the thing though is that they're playing so much better and you can see the pieces there and we'll go into maybe reasons why there's struggles a little bit but the it's hard to identify certain things sometimes with this team because with full roster, without full roster, with whatever, they have similar games to that second game against the Pelicans where for majority of the game, you're like, oh, the Warriors are winning this game. They're just dominating. And then there's just down the stretch, things just don't go their way or it's not the lack of trying either. Mm -hmm. It's just things fall apart naturally and the other team just pulls out ahead and I remember with like three minutes left in that game, I was like, oh yeah, the Warriors are going to lose this game. I- I've seen this game. And it was like a tie game. And it was just, I've seen this enough at this point to say that. And I know you mentioned hovering around 500. I mean, the, right now, the 33 and 33 with games against Thunder coming up right here and six games left. I just, I don't know what the betting odds are, but if you have all your money and just mortgage your house and do everything you need to do, bet it on this team going 500 in the end because there's just no way this team is destined not to be am i am i wrong no you're really right and and literally the funny thing is is as i was i was looking at those remaining six games and okay what what again the age-old question that we revisited so many times what is success in these last few games what do they do and it's literally well if they could get three wins that's what it would (laughs) maybe four but three would, would suffice, would get them to where they, they, I guess at this point need to be. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would not be surprised at all if they ended this season right at 500. Yes. And if you look at the schedule, it also kind of makes sense to yeah. say right around 500, they have two games at home against the thunder. And again, it would, it would take a massive let down to an extreme for the Warriors and and I'm being serious to lose one of these games because the Thunder are trying to lose like they are they are that bad and and I guess I'm setting myself up for again a situation in which the Warriors might disappoint or whatever but those are two games they should and need to win then after that you have the Phoenix and Utah games that you're just you know we've circled way back when and said we don't know and and we wondered at one point, would those teams start resting players at that point? But those teams are jockeying for the number one seed. So mm-hmm. I don't see them resting anybody at all. And the good news for the Warriors are the rest of the games are at home where they play a lot better. More fans will be coming into the stands. But then you have the Pelicans again. You also have the Grizzlies. And that might end up being the biggest game of the entire season because that's the team they're probably head to head with if all things go as we kind of think they are to decide who's going to be the eight seed pretty much in the end. Absolutely. I mean, that's the game that it, they don't want it to come down to that last game. And and the Warriors need to set themselves up for avoiding that being the the deciding (laughs) factor. So yes, like they have to win these two Oklahoma games. Like they, they cannot lose those games they have one more game against the pelicans they really need to win that game too because as you mentioned you have the jazz and the suns you know the warriors have won against really good teams before but it's always you can't you can't count on that so you know if they could take one of those two games great but they can't ride on one of those two games to get them that third one they have to beat the pelicans they have to beat the thunder 
because yeah, I mean, if you're then they want the set, they want that seven or eight seed because those seeds in the play in tournament are the, the winner of that game. That matchup is the only team that doesn't have to play twice in the play in tournament. That is the only game that would allow you to just automatically get a bid in the playoffs. And that's what the Warriors want. They want to avoid as many play in games as possible. And if they can avoid it, you know, that last game being the deciding factor, that's a lot of pressure to put on one game. So they need to set themselves up for success. But it was really interesting because the other night after the second Pelicans game, we were talking to the players about playing the six games at home. And Steph Curry had an interesting point of view. And he said, it's great that we get to close out the season at home with six straight games, but it also can kind of be a trap because you are thinking you have this home court advantage because you're sleeping in your own bed. You're seeing your kids and your families and you have fans and you just, you just assume that that's going to give you a push, but that could also kind of set you back because you're so comfortable just being at home and the Warriors have been known to kind of get a little too relaxed here and there, which I think is a reason sometimes why they do lose these late games. Um, and so they, they can't let that happen. Yeah. Especially in the past. And Steph Curry is a lot of times referring to past teams when they were, when they were elite, you would see very slow starts sometimes at home because exactly what you're saying their their foot wouldn't be all the way down on the pedal. And what would happen is, They'd have a pretty large deficit and then the third quarter would happen and they'd be like, oh, let's wake up at halftime. And then they'd just blow out the other team as the fans go crazy. And that's how it used to go. Can't do that anymore. The margin of error is just way too small. But um, yeah, you, 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 the home game's coming up. You got six of them. I mean, this has been circled on the calendar for a little while of saying this is your chance to make up ground. But again, as we said, Utah, Phoenix, we do not know. So these Thunder games are very, very important. And, you know, injuries have added up and, and have really mounted. And it, there's, there's a good reason why this team should be tired. And they kind of started to see that. You kind of see them kind of wearing down just a little bit, especially at the end of that road trip. And for the Warriors, Kelly Oubre, we still do not know what's going to happen with him. I personally, I... I I have my doubts if we'll see him again, unless they made an extended run in, in the playoffs. Oh, I do want to remind people exactly how the play-in play tournament yes. actually works because it is a little bit confusing. So just to explain it one more time. So you have the seven, eight, nine, and 10. Those four teams are in the play-in tournament. How it goes is seven plays eight. Whoever wins that game is automatically the seven seed in the playoffs. They're just in, they win that game. The loser of that game gets another opportunity and then they play the winner of nine and 10. Whoever loses nine and 10 is just out of the playoffs, right? So if you're in the nine or 10 seed, you have to win two games to get in the playoffs. So what ends up happening is the loser of seven and eight plays the winner of nine and 10. And then whoever wins that game is the eighth seed going forward. So that's just to explain it one more time. It's two separate games. And then so whoever's in the seven and eight has to win one of two games. Whoever's in the nine and 10 has to win both games. And mm -hmm. that's how you get into the playoffs. So now that I explained that just a great little bit. That was great. <laughs> Is everyone on the same page here? That's everyone? Really yep. good. <laughs> Phew. Okay. See, I'm good at some things. Now the mounting injuries, we do not know what's going to happen to Kelly Oubre. The Warriors have desperate, they, they've, They've felt the loss of Damian Lee not out there. The bench, there's just moments out there. You just can see where they need that extra shot. He's shooting almost 40% from three. Uh, he, was, he was red hot when he went down with COVID. So um, there, there's no timetable yet on his return, but we're, we should be getting closer to it. Um, you, 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 there's just Eric Paschal. Uh, Kendra, what's the latest on Eric Paschal? He's a guy who during this homestand, they are going to, you know, reevaluate with him and stuff because the team didn't shoot around and practice as much in the later stretches of that road trip. They just haven't been able to give the full evaluation um, to see where his body's at. And they didn't practice today because they got back super late last night. Um, but I'd imagine in these next couple of days, they'll start to really reevaluate him to see, can he join us for these final six games? Should we not push it? Should we wait and see if we get into the, the playoffs to bring him back, but hopefully we should be getting an official update on him soon. 
Right. Absolutely. So those are three key pieces, Ubre, Lee, Pascal. We have Bazemore back playing. Um, you have other guys that have, have fought through injuries and, and nagging, you know, just things that are flaring up, but they're just, this is the time of year. They, they kind of just have to brush it off and, and, and keep on playing. So Steve Kerr right now is using an eight man rotation. That's without Damien, without Eric and without Ubre in there, that would have been 11 people, which means there are two spots right now that they're just not playing that person. And right now, we'll put it this way. Nico Mannion is a two-way player. And could they use Nico Mannion in certain situations? Sure, maybe if you need more bodies. But they're at the point where they're trying to avoid using inexperience. And they, they, they kind of need to settle in on the veterans. But that's a two-way player. We're talking about Alan Smilagich. And you and I, when Wiseman went down, I said, you have to add a big man. You cannot just go out there without big men. Well, and then we laughed and said, well, Smiley Gooch is there. Why don't they just use him? It does, it's not an option right now. And at some point, and we kind of brought this up before, you have to say to yourself, well, if he's not an option to play, why is he the full active roster? And that is a fair question, but I'm going to give it a little extra pushback. Ooh. If he's on the roster and cannot play, why are there two spots on the roster that are open right now that they have not filled at least one of them to have an able body? Because right now, if you have three guys out to injury, you have two spots that are open and you're not going to play Alan Smilagic. That's six spots that are unusable. And oh, by the way, James Wiseman as well is mm -hmm. unusable. Clay Thompson is unusable. So you're looking at a team that you have two spots open. You can get a 10 day guy just to play spot minutes, just to spell some people. It's just, you, you start asking questions like that, Kendra. And it's not as much about Smiley as much as, well, you have two other spots that are open if you're not going to use them. If you, then you can get back to the part where you're like, well, why do you have a guy on the active roster if you're not using him? 100%. I think, and I honestly think that them signing something is something to monitor in these next couple days and next few weeks because it we did ask Steve Kerr about that we said are you are you going to bring in reinforcements because it really as you, everything you just laid out it just doesn't make a lot of sense and he said that that's something that he's going to talk to Bob Myers about to see what they can do at this point in the season who's out there they brought in Gary Payton the second on that 10 day they signed him to two 10 days and they said that they really liked what he brought but then they didn't bring him back again and one of the reasons, at least earlier in the season, um, when they weren't, I mean, they've kind of been suffering injuries all season long, but it feels like it's really mounted up at this point. I think a reason why they didn't necessarily cut Smiley then or move, make any moves then is because particularly with the two-way contracts. I think if they wanted to bring anyone in full-time, it would have been a guy like Juan Toscano Anderson. But of course, the NBA took away the, the game restrictions for two-way players. So it was kind of like a standard contract this year. Um, not money-wise, obviously, but game game usage-wise and stuff. Um, but now, it, no, it, it is, it does make you wonder because they look so tired. They, like, they're... That's, I really do believe that's what happened in that second game against the Pelicans is that at a certain point, running eight guys around for so long just does take a toll on your body, especially at this point in the season. And if they, again, if they want to make this push, particularly past the play-in tournament, if they make it past the play-in tournament and they say, okay, here we are in the first round, we want to at least be competitive chances are you're not going to be able to do that with eight guys. And that's not to say that Damian Lee won't be ready by then because he should be, or else that is concerning for a whole other reason and stuff. But, but you do need to, you don't want to bring in someone the day the playoffs start and just say, good luck, go make an impact and help us win. You need a little bit of a buffer time. So it, I, I would, I'm definitely going to be looking at that for the next couple of days. And keep in mind, a buyout player or a player that has been waived can no longer be on your playoff roster going forward. It has to be a person that's been a free agent the whole season that you'd bring in and move on to the roster moving forward. But it's funny because in the beginning, we would we 
talked about Smiley Geach's spot and everything, but they don't need to cut him. They literally have two spots available if they wanted to add somebody. So at this point, you'd think they might want to. You know, when I said they need a big, my concern was at the time that you, you're running Draymond Green into the ground at center. And more importantly, it uh, put a lot of pressure on Kavon Looney. I mean, but he's playing the minutes. The guy's playing 25 to 30 minutes almost every night, which I just, it's so, I'm so happy to see him making it through that and playing well. So um, that's kind of solidified them in the center spot because they have decided, which is true, right now they're best when they go small. And so that's kind of where they're going. And Juan Toscano Anderson, who we'll talk about in a second, has really helped out that situation. But you're talking about an eight-man rotation. Michael Mulder is a guy that's playing a ton of minutes right now. And I can, while Michael Mulder is doing some nice things, that is not somebody when you go into playoffs that you're just like, oh, we're going to really rely on him as an eight man rotation, including him. No, you need a Damian Lee. You need Eric Pascal, Kelly Oubre. Yeah. I mean, that's who, that's who they really also need out there. But <laughs> those are, those are the issues that are happening right now. You can see, the, the, the tread on the tires is starting to wear thin and, and, and they're, but they're fighting. And that's the thing. And that is one thing we need to, need to know here. Mm-hmm. They are competing and where you might see them getting tired is just the shots, your tired legs, the shots start going short and flat. Maybe they're not moving as much on offense because you have to conserve your energy for defense on the other end. Those are the type of things that you start seeing as issues. And, um, we're at the part of the season where certain people are stepping up at a time they need them. And other people are just, they've been fighting all season and it's wearing on them. Um, I do want to ask you, Kendra, and like right now, when we're looking at Steph Curry, I mean, he's been incredible, amazing enough, but we can go forever about how good Steph Curry has been. But recently, especially the production is picked up by certain key members because we're talking about eight people and yet they're winning, right? Without Uber, without Lee, without Pascal. Who are some silver linings type people we can talk about from the production standpoint? Well, the first person I'm going to start with, and I actually asked Steve Kerr about this the other day. I said, can you call your second best player an X factor player? Because usually the X factor is sixth man, right. maybe seventh man, maybe it's your third scorer, whoever, but Draymond Green has completely kept this team afloat during these injuries. You know, his defense against the Pelicans was instrumental in that first win. You know, yes, Zion scored, I think 32 points in that Mm -hmm. first game, but he made it difficult. None of his points, none of Zion's points were just given to him. And that's because of Draymond Green defense. Plus he's scoring. He is picking up that scoring production because he knows, okay, yes, we don't have Kelly Oubre. We don't have Damian Lee. That right there is like 25, 30 points the Warriors are missing. They need to get it from somewhere else. And Draymond Green can score the ball. How many three-pointers did he hit in those two games against the Pelicans? Because I think it was more than he did the week leading up to that in those two games, you know? So it's, it's, it's so crazy how much, you know, Draymond has always been impactful for this team and you really saw that when he was out on the defensive end but now we're starting to also see just how big of an impact he has offensively when you take in his scoring and then of course his ball handling and his facilitating yeah i I, this is i mean they've made comments about it steph's made jokes about it draymond's alluded to it especially on instagram stories and everything how good of shape he is in the diet everything he is feeling good and you can see it and the numbers throughout the season have been getting better and better and better, but you just watch it and it's a qualitative versus quantitative thing. And if we're talking quantitative, I can give you stats that shows how good Draymond Green has been. And we'll start with that. The last 13 games, and this is a stretch run, right? By the way, this is nothing new where Draymond Green kicks it into gear late in the season and then playoff Draymond happens, which is an elite, elite Hall of Fame player. For the last 13 games, these are the numbers other than scoring. rebounds, 9.8 assists, over two steals, and over one block per game to go with the eight points per game on 55% shooting from the field. He's almost averaging close to a triple-double, but in a different way in that, yes, he's facilitating an offense and doing all those things, but he's doing all that triple-double stuff while being even better defensively. 
And that's where the qualitative stuff cu cuts in. Yes, those numbers are great over two steals, 1.2 blocks. That's great. But just watch it. And he is blowing up plays. He is everywhere. He's pushing the pace from defense to offense. He's running the transition. But because what he does defensively, he allows the team to start moving. He's in passing lanes. He's deflecting passes. The contesting that he's doing. The way he's breaking up lobs. The way he's helping defense everywhere. What he did against Zion Williamson to win him defensive player of the year already. And again, don't look at the stats. You don't have to look at the stats. You just need to watch the game. So I agree with you completely in terms of production recency. It just the, my recency bias about Draymond Green right now is that he's the automatic defensive player of the year. Right. And I you know that's crazy that we haven't even really been having that conversation or maybe everyone's just so locked in on the MVP conversation. And then also, you know, a couple months ago, the rookie of the year conversation, but no one's really been talking about you know, the defensive player of the year, the sixth man of the year, those conversations have kind of been put on the back burner, but I 100% Draymond Green is in that conversation, if not the choice. And, you know, it's so crazy because Draymond's always been a good player, you know, but this season has really allowed us to grow a new appreciation for just how much he can impact the game because before you never really saw it or it wasn't as obvious I'll say you know when you're playing with Steph Clay Thompson Kevin Durant it's easy to kind of get lost in that shuffle and now Draymond Green as big as his role was in the, with those championship teams then he's had to take on even more responsibility in a bigger role now and just seeing how well he's adapted to that and just how much you know, he can change everything is really honestly astounding. Even though we knew he was good, it just never felt like this magnitude this year. I mean, his passing has gotten even better than it ever has. And just the way he's playing it really, it's just defensively, he has been a monster and it just, I'm telling you, you can look at stats. Sure. But just watch the game, watch him on plays. I know it's just every now and then for fun, watch a defensive set and just stare at Draymond Green and what he's doing out there, barking orders, hedging here, stopping here. That person's not going to pass the ball to that guy because he sees Draymond Green on it. So he helps off. It's just, it's astounding. So that is somebody that has stepped up as well. But Andrew Wiggins mm -hmm. has really impressed me of late because not only has he stepped up his scoring, he's doing it in times when Steph's not out there and when times they need him to. And that has been something that people have wondered about throughout the season. They're saying, Oh, he's been consistent. His numbers are pretty good throughout the year. Defensively, uh, I mean, he's been great. Uh, as, as a man-on-man man -man defender, uh, he's been fantastic. Off-ball, still some things to work on, but just lockdown, absolutely, as a wing, uh, which is enough. That by itself should be enough to be, like, very excited about Andrew Wiggins. But offensively, you can see the aggression and assertiveness at times they need him to be. And look at these numbers. And this is the last 28 games. Okay. We're talking, that's a huge chunk of the season, right? And by the way, he's played, I don't know, every game, which is a whole nother uh, ability is availability. But last 28 games, averaging over 20 points per game, 20.3, 49% from the field, 42% from three, over five rebounds, just under three assists, over one steal a game, one block a game. He's doing all these things in the 42 point something percent from three is just, I'll put it this way. If you, if I told you before the season, Andrew Wiggins is going to become one of the premier wing defenders <laughs> and he's going to shoot over 42% for a huge chunk of the season from three, you'd be like, yeah, um, oh, the Warriors will take that and right. they'll be very happy about it. So it's just, they're, the dialogue out there by people is just based on old reputation when it comes to Andrew Wiggins. Because if you clean the slate and just focused on him this season, you'd be very excited about him. This season is the former number one draft pick that, you know, Andrew Wiggins was. And, and you just, then you kind of, when you read those stats, or at least when I hear you read those stats, all I kind of start thinking of is, okay, then you're going to put him next to Clay Thompson as well. Exactly. And you have two incredible two-way wing players with Draymond Green, with Steph Curry, that's and and James Wiseman, that's going to be has potential to be such a lethal lineup. But yeah, I mean, what Andrew Wiggins has done again, you say Kelly Oubre missed a huge chunk of games, came back for a little bit, and then is out again. 
Where are we going to get those points from? And Andrew Wiggins, who you said has been consistent all year long, said, well, I'll take on 10 of those points. I'll, I'll bring them. I'll make up for that. And he has, you know, those two games against New Orleans, again, you know, he was just great. You know, he was a huge reason why the Warriors had a chance to win that second game down the stretch. And in the first game, he was there when Steph Curry was still finding his groove and finding his rhythm. Um, so yes, the Warriors should be feeling very happy with, with how Andrew Wiggins has done for them this season. Absolutely. And you can look towards next season and you can say, wow, if he's the third or fourth scorer, you're feeling very good. If he plays that defense, like they would feel very good about that. But the other thing is, and this is just the fact of the matter, since it is a business, his value has never been higher than mm -hmm. what it is right now. So if they were going to do a trade and he had to be involved, this is the first time in his career with that contract that he would be an asset more than a throw-in or a salary filler. Mm -hmm. A team getting him would be excited to get Andrew Wiggins at this point. It wouldn't be one of those, well, to make salaries work, uh, fine, we'll take Andrew Wiggins. Which is kind of a little bit what happened when the Warriors traded away D'Angelo Russell they were like, yeah, I think we'll take Andrew Wiggins. You know, he has a chance to be good. He does this and that. And then they turned him into what they wanted to. And it actually worked out in that regard. But they got that first round pick. And that was where they really were happy. And that's what they wanted to. Um, so for the first time, he is, he is more of a valuable asset with that contract than he has ever been um, in his short time with that contract, of course. So that, that, that is key. So while we are looking forward to the future of seeing him on this roster, there is just the option out there that that could be a, a situation. Kendra. You're right. And, and it, it would be interesting to me because I, I feel that a reason that he has been able to kind of turn that reputation around for him is the way that the Warriors have been using him. And he hasn't been the center of their offense. He hasn't been their first scorer and has only really started to, be relied upon as their secondary scorer. And I think that's why he's been able to succeed so much. So I'd be interested to see if he did end up somewhere else, how that role, because assuming if they trade him, maybe he ends up on a place where they do want him to be the primary scorer, how that, how he does in that kind of situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, just from a, a perspective of someone who enjoys watching the Warriors I, I just I would love to see Andrew Wiggins on a fully healthy like title contending team because I really do think he has what the, the the goods to be something very significant as long as not too much pressure as you were saying if he goes to another team I think the Warriors would need if they're going to trade him the person that they're trading him for or the package that they're trading him for would have to be what they think as like the best thing ever because the Warriors know Steve Kerr, Bob Myers, they know what Andrew Wiggins has helped them accomplish this season or just how maybe not accomplished, but just kept them afloat this season. And they understand the potential that he has and that this team has when they do have a fully health, fully healthy roster. Um, so I, I just, I would have, I believe that they would want the receiving thing to just be out of this world yeah i, I mean i i don't they, they're trading him as part of a package for a star they're not they're not going to do anything less than that it wouldn't make sense because he's really valuable to them um and then finally one other guy that just needs to be talked about and I, I mean it's funny where we were months ago if i said the key down the playoff stretch in the race is Juan Toscano anderson will be a huge member but it's just a fact it is a fact of the matter the last 19 games that he has played, you know, he's sat out with injury, et cetera. He's, he's averaging almost 21 points for uh, 21 minutes, not points, 21 minutes per game. Uh, and that's raised more and more uh, the last week or two. But sure, six points, you're like, all right, that's a good contribution. It's on 68% from the field. You're shooting 47% from three, averaging over four rebounds, almost three assists, almost one steal, uh, like 0.6 blocks. He's doing, he's filling up the stat sheet. And with that, he's also, if you have to watch him instead of just looking at stats, what he does is he makes the right pass. It doesn't mean he's getting the assist, but he swings the ball to the right person. He's able to penetrate and kick. He keeps the offense moving. There's a reason they're kind of giving him some love of this 
like a Draymond Green light or an Andre Iguodala type role, because what he is doing out there is, is impacting the team with the, all the intangibles. Oh, and then you add in the 47% from three, right? So I, I've just, I am so impressed by Juan Toscano Anderson. I am, I thoroughly am excited to watch him play on a fully guaranteed contract next season with the Warriors. Cause if that doesn't happen, then I, I, something went dramatically wrong You're going so. to the streets grant <laughs> is throwing a fit if they don't sign jta yeah. but you're right his basketball iq is incredible especially for a guy i mean you know he is 27 and you do have to remember that it's like he's been around not necessarily in the nba but he has been around at the professional level overseas and stuff and it's showing his understanding of the game is really showing out there and Absolutely. You know, the intangible things that he does, the energy he brings, the hustle plays, he cracked his head open on a hustle play being like, I'm not going to let that ball go out of bounds. He didn't need to do that, but he did, he wanted to. And so those are the things that you just need on a team, especially one that's been going through a lot of, you know, roster changes or injuries or down moments is that you, you need a guy like him. He, is always very honest and blunt and just says it how it is. And I think the Warriors, they like those kinds of guys. It is a dream on green light, as you said. Um, So yes, I would also be very surprised if the Warriors did not convert him to a standard contract. And again, I think a reason why they haven't done it is because the NBA took away the G league maximum games that he, if, if they still had, I think it was a 45 game limit. I believe that they would have converted him, especially as they went through all these injuries, but because they didn't save some money, pay him when, when it's time to, I think, I think this season was 50, but like, yeah, 50 games, but your, your point is exactly right. And I, I remember talking to you and said the worst thing that happened to Juan Tosano Anderson was them changing that limit a little bit. While it was great that he'll play a lot for this team. One of the worst things that happened was they weren't forced to make him a guaranteed contract. (laughs) But um, the guy has done everything that you need to do. And, and, and sure, have we talked about him a lot on these pods? Yes. But what a great person to talk about. And, what, and, and you're right about his honesty and everything. Like, I will say it again. My favorite person to listen to in a postgame presser because he just he, – he absorbs just the, the, the energy of it and just kind of spits facts. And, and you can see the emotion he wears on his sleeve as he's talking to people and he engaging – I just, I, I mean, I feel like I'm having a conversation with him and I'm literally not even asking a question. Everyone else is doing that for me. I was going to say, you know, as, as a member of the media and stuff like that, I can only think of one other player who was on a two-way contract who media members wanted to hear from or valued their opinion as much as Juan Toscano Anderson and that's Torrey Craig when he was a two-way on the Denver Nuggets but there are just not many two-way players who people say we care about his evaluation of the team we care what he thinks of what went wrong because typically two-way players aren't put in a position to have full-fledged full thought-out opinions on what's going on with the team and that just says so much that People want to hear what he has to say, and he can give you, you know, a stark and accurate evaluation of everything. And it just speaks to how how much of an impact he's had on this team. Absolutely. And he's going to be impacting this team so much. So um, we will be with you the rest of the way, of course. And I'm excited to break down the, the next three wins and three losses for this team <laughs> because there is no way on earth they are finishing with anything other than a 36 and 36 record. And, and this is coming from a guy who I, I'm looking at the schedule and being like, oh, they can actually win more than three games. But I'm, 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 <laughs> I have learned so much by now that if I don't say that, I just the chances are I will look stupid. So I'm just going to say, Kendra, this team will go 500. Love it. Uh, and we'll be there with all of you the rest of the way. All right, rate, subscribe, comment, do all the things that we ask of you because, uh, well, we really actually appreciate it. And as always, thank you so much. It's the Dub Sock Podcast presented by Wendy's. And I hope you have a nice morning, afternoon, night, and whatever else.